freebie. Quick freebie. It wasn't in my notes. Babel was man coming together to build a throne to God. And God confuses language and they split up. Day of Pentecost, they came together from many nations. And the Spirit of God fell. And suddenly there was the church, one new man in Christ Jesus. Actually, right there, you've got the tree of knowledge versus the tree of life. Because when the Spirit of God birthed, and, and Christ would come by the Spirit to lead every single person individually together into our destiny as we keep in step with the Spirit. Because actually, our cultures can't save us, but the King among us living in our hearts will. And as we as Christians eat of the tree of life and leave our cultures, the parts that are not like Him, we find Him, we find each other. Quick freebie. But anyway, so let's jump in. And I've got, I feel like I'm burning time too quickly. So I want to try and move quickly through some quick thoughts, quick history, important, but I think it is important. Greece rises, Greece falls. And the Roman Empire emerges, arguably one of the greatest civilizations in terms of what it did. And from 30 BC to 500 AD, it establishes Greek thinking across the Western, the now Western world. And what it does is it actually takes slaves from nations. Many of us, our ancestors, would have ta been taken to Rome to be slaves. Two out of every three people in Rome are slaves. And it colonizes every culture to Roman thinking, Roman understanding, Roman law. In fact, South Africa's legal system up until recently was called Roman Dutch law, which tells you 2,000 years or oh, 1,500 years after the fall of Rome, our legal system in this country was still based upon Roman, Dutch, which is ultimately Greek thought. <laughs> All right. So the Roman Empire rules. And then in the Roman Empire, there's a man called Constantine. Constantine is a, is a, is a heathen. He argues whether he gets saved or not, but he has an encounter with the Lord. And he makes Christianity the religion of of Rome. And basically every pagan has to now stop being a pagan because if you're a pagan, Rome will kill you. Before that, if you're a Christian, they would kill you. But that was massively significant because suddenly even people that aren't born again are thinking Greek, Roman, Christian thinking. And then there's a man called Augustine that emerges in 354. Arguably today, most scholars, most theologians will tell you he was the greatest mind in in Christian history. And Augustine, in 354, was born, is a Neoplatonic philosopher. Now, I want you to listen to that. Neoplatonic, Plato. So he is trained to think the way Plato thought, the one who trained, the man who trained Alexander the Great. And so he emerges with a theology that becomes the foundation, firstly, of the Roman Catholic church. And so, a Neoplatonic thought is this. If you go look up uh, uh, Augustine, he's actually, w Wikipedia picks him up firstly, that he's a Neoplatonic philosopher before he's a theologian. Interesting. But he becomes arguably one of the greatest theologians, if not the greatest theologian in the world, in history. And Neoplatonic thinking does this. This is the core of it. How the soul develops through knowledge. What is that? It takes Greek thinking and it applies it into how does stuff work and how can we better ourselves? And so what it does is it comes to the Bible and a bit like the Pharisees, diligently studies the scriptures, eats of the tree of knowledge, but refuses to come to Jesus to have life. And so the theology starts to take people away from God instead of to God. And we start debating how does this work? It's not long after that a man called Martin Luther gets up in 1500s. And Martin Luther is an Augustinian monk, which tells you that his thinking is shaped by Plato, Greek thinking. And then a man called Calvin emerges. And Calvin bases his entire Calvinist theology upon Augustine, who based himself upon Plato. And what does Calvinism teach? I'm picking on you guys because I'm not one. <laughs> How does it work? How does predestination work? How does it, what is it wanting to do? Can I say this? Arminians say they base themselves upon 
Augustine. In fact, pretty much every significant Christian theological thought spawns out of Augustine's thought. Now, not everything he did was bad. There was a lot of good in it. But the thing I want you to see is this. The root of it is Neoplatonic thinking. How does stuff work and how can we better ourselves? And that's what the tree of knowledge offered, didn't it? And we can look just now at how we get stuck with this. Am I making sense? All right. And out of that, I, I'll, I'll leave some out. The Renaissance, basically, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution, all those things developed modern man in the Western world. And remember, <laughs> the Western civilization is underpinned by ultimately what the Roman world, Roman Greek world brought. So that, and there's a, there's a respected Jewish rabbi, his name was Herschel. He, he lived about 70 years ago, very respected by secular people. He wasn't a Christian, he was a Jew. But listen to what he said. I think this is profound. The Greeks learned in order to comprehend. The Hebrews learned in order to revere. Modern man learns in order to master or use. Think about that. The Hebrews, the Hebrews would read their Bibles and go, God is so big, so much bigger than us. And he revered. The Greeks studied to understand. And modern man, through the Industrial Revolution and through the Renaissance, now works out Neoplatonic thought into us. How does this work and how can I better myself? And so we start writing books like this. The seven ways to get your breakthrough. How's it all going to end? I'm going to give you the, the keys. We want knowledge. We want, we desire, we want to know how it works because if we know how it works, we can be prepared. We can get on life without God. We can ultimately, through eating of the tree of knowledge, survive when the world falls apart. <laughs> and this becomes the root of Western Christianity. And then God drops this bomb on us. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. <laughs> Could you put it up for me? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And I did a little study to find out how much higher are the heavens higher than the earth. And today, if they look at the heavens, they can see with modern telescopes um, 46 billion light years away. They can see planets and stars. 46 billion light years. And that's as far as we can see. We just can't see further than that. We know there's more out there. We, just are, we can't see that far yet because we don't have lenses strong enough. 46 billion light years, okay? The speed of light travels at 300,000 kilometers in one second. And God says, what we can see, 46 billion light years. He says, that's how much higher I am than you. That's how much my thoughts are higher than yours. You see, man wants to understand. Modern man wants to understand. He wants to comprehend so that he can control. And God says, you will not get control because I am God. In fact, that's why the Jews were ultimately rejected. Because instead of their father Abraham who walked by faith, not by sight, they started to lean upon the scriptures so much that they thought they understood. And when the king came among them, they used the scriptures against him. <laughs> it's terrifying, isn't it? I've got to confess to you, it's actually, if you get this, it is terrifying. You think, dear God. Could I do that? Could I actually fall into that trap? Yeah. You're already in that trap. Your foot's in it. Mine too. And I'm trying. To, the good thing is when you realize that, it kind of humbles you. And you go, okay, I don't understand. But I know the one who knows all things. I, I have access to the tree of life. And though I don't fathom and I can't understand, you do, God. Because ultimately, God wanted faith, trust in him. Man wanted to trust himself. And be God. So we look at how the Roman world and the Greek world has influenced us. Do you know that when we were all farmers years ago, along with our ancestors, do you know what is valued? The human body in gyms was not. Athletics and sport was not. 
But our culture celebrates, celebrates athletes like they're gods. If Brian Abana was part of our church, if he had to walk through those doors now, <laughs> walks through the, now what does he do? He's quite quick and he chases a little pigskin ball around a field. That's his claim to fame. That's it. What does he do? He's faster than the rest of us and he chases a pigskin ball around the field. That's what he does. But he walks through those doors. What would you do? <gasps> and you're running over. Brian, and can I get a selfie? And it's on Facebook and Instagram. And everything because actually I got to spend a moment with Brian Abana. What's his claim to fame? He's fast. And he chases a pigskin ball around. We value our lens of value is now through a Greek lens, not through a kingdom lens. Because God doesn't care very much for pigskin ball. In fact, he probably thinks it's pretty pointless. And some of you are prepared to give up God and the things of God so that your children can chase after a little pigskin ball. And you'll forsake the gathering of the saints so that your kid can be all he can be. And let me tell you, a pigskin ball is going to count for nothing in eternity. Your value system is corrupting the way you live your life. You've actually got an idol. It's a little pigskin ball. You stick it on yourself and it's like, oh, I give my life to that idol, my children to that idol. And it's here and it's gone. We value sport far too highly. <laughs> but we corrupted. We corrupted by Greek culture. <laughs> Wealth, another thing. The Greeks idolized, the, the, the Olympic Games is where it all came from. Men running around naked, showing off their physiques. And it's like, oh, and today, gyms pumping out. Guys walking around in tight t-shirts. What is that? What is that? It's Greek thinking. And you feel good about yourself when you look at the little muscles rippling. It's like, ha, oh, oh. ha. Greek thinking. And we value the... We, and God looks at that and he goes, seriously? It's dust. And I'm going to show you that it's dust. You're 20 now. 40's coming. <laughs> 40's coming. 50's coming. Help us, Jesus. So, okay, that's just a funny way. That's what, and you realize our value system is rooted in this. It is. If a rich man walks into our meetings... If a rich man walks into our meetings, there's a different compared to the poor man. But the Bible says that the poor man is actually the one who's exalted in the kingdom, and the rich man has a low position. <laughs> we just corrupt the kingdom. We, we colonize the kingdom with Greek thought. And let's dig into some really scary ones. So listen, Greeks think like this, logic thought, and logic goes like this. One plus one, your schooling system is based on this, equals do. In fact, some of you went beyond one plus one. You can actually do science and maths that is just way beyond. But it's all logic. It's all worked out systematically. It's always going to be that's the way it works. The Greek mind thinks systematically. How does stuff work logically? And, it, and it's again, it's, a, it's really, it's kind of a deep study on the tree of knowledge. How does it work? Maths. Logical thought. The, the Hebrews thought like this. Greeks said one plus one is two. Hebrews went like this, one plus one equals one plus one. In other words, <laughs> one plus one doesn't have to equal two. There's a mystery here. And the Greek mind starts going. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to show you just how bad it is now. Now we're going to get into the fun. So the Bible says, let me ask you a question. Does God love you? One of the most famous scriptures in our generation. It's punted all the time. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing in all creation. The heart depths, angels, demons. There's nothing. I'm secure in the love of God. Greek thinking. And it's a lack of comforting scripture. It's like, oh, when I'm sleeping with my girlfriend, nothing can separate me from the love of God. When I'm not tithing, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And you realize Greek thinking is starting to get stuck. So then we end up with this new thing called, it's a new thinking, it's Gnostic. It's actually, it's rooted in what, basically, <laughs> Gnostic thought is this. It's divorced from reality. So, so basically, you start to walk around with an assurance that you shouldn't have. I believed, and so nothing can separate me. I'm saved forever. 
Do you know that the Jews believed they were eternally saved? <laughs> when Jesus said, you children of the devil, they went, <laughs> we are sons of Abraham. We are secure in Abraham. He said, God can raise up out of his rocks, sons of Abraham. And the Greek guy goes, well, but once a son, always a son. Okay, your thought, I'm going to use Greek thinking to mess your head up. The devil was one called the son of God. And you were once called the son of Satan. You're a child of the devil. So if you were a child of the devil, how did you become an unchild of the devil? And if you're a child of God, then can you become an unchild of God? Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. But you see, the Greek mind, and I'm not going to mess with your heads. Now your heads are going to start to, I'm going to have, so listen to this. So God loves you. And does he love you? Yes, he does, actually. And it's just because he is really amazing, and you're not. <laughs> he loved you while you were an enemy. And again, again, Greek, we want value. So we've got to counsel people that, no. And this thinking now, you know, God, you couldn't do heaven without me. So you brought heaven down. And there's a thinking in us that we had some intrinsic worth because the Greek needs to feel that he's worth something. Because if he doesn't, his world collapses. God, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an Andrew-shaped hole in God that only Andrew can fill. God needs me. He needs my love. And God says, I don't need your love. I'm quite happy within myself. You're a worm. You dust. I, I mean, literally, you dust. You're like a piece of Lego. Plastic. Yeah, did they go on tomorrow? But because I'm love, I love you. Don't come with you think you're worth something. You're worth nothing. Your worth is because I give you worth. Because I loved you with an everlasting love that you could never earn and you could never deserve. And if you think it's because of you, there's some deep crack that we've got to fix. And then let's go further. Can God love you and hate you? In Greek mind, mm -mm. I don't know. I don't think he can. Because surely if I love somebody... I can't hate him in the same sentence. So if he's my friend, which we, how many know we're friends of God? Are we friends of God? Yes, we're friends of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If I'm your friend, can I be your enemy? And the Greek man says, no, you can't. You can't be my friend and my enemy. I can't. But then the Bible drops this bomb in Romans 11, the book of Romans of all scriptures. Romans 11, 28 and 29. Romans 11, 28 and 29. And again, I'm just showing you Greek versus Hebrew thinking here. Did you put it up for me? Hmm. Is it, they're too scared to put it up. <laughs> Romans 11, 28 and 29. It says this as they find it. God is, he had Paul's writing about the Jews and, and he says this. The Jews thought they were eternally secure. But then they got cut off. And how many have for 2,000 years, Jews who are not believing in Jesus have died outside of salvation? Okay. And so Paul's arguing about this and he's going, they were cut off. And then the question is, but then the Bible says God's gift and his call are irrevocable. So how does that work? Remember, he's talking to Romans. He's talking to Greeks. He's talking to, how does that work? How can God's gift and call be irrevocable? In other words, he never takes it back. But then the Jews are cut off. God made a promise, and now it's like the promise has failed. And Greeks are like, uh, 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 uh. And then he says, now, God's promise didn't fail. He, he answers it two ways. Not everyone who thinks they're a Jew is a, is a Jew. And secondly, the Jews will be saved. There will be a revival in the last days, and there will be an outpouring of the Spirit upon the Jewish nation, and they'll run to the cross. But you see, he thinks, in, he thinks national. We read Romans individual. That's where we get stuck. Greeks think me. Hebrews think us. So we think, we, now we're trying to make eternal promises or promises to nations, an individual promise to me. For 2,000 years, Greeks have, uh, Jews have been cut off from Christ individually. <laughs> and then he says, have I got it? As far as the gospel is concerned, uh, they are enemies of Christ for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. So you go, hang on. In one sentence, he's just said, they're enemies and they loved. Do you realize that you might be loved by God and be his enemy? Now the Greek mind goes, I don't get that. 
just, it's true. So because God says nothing can separate from his love, if God is love, then he actually must love the devil too somehow. <laughs> I mean, if he is love, then he, he, he can hate the devil and love the devil. And can I say this? But the Greek mind is now battling. It's like, whoa, hang on, Andrew. What are you saying? What are you saying? Well, that's it, that you can be enemies and loved in the same sentence. And then Paul goes on to say this. And don't think that you are secure as Gentiles. Because the, the Jews were in him. They were, they grew up in him. And they got all these promises. Well, there's just so many promises. And if they were cut off, don't think you secure because you were grafted in. Most Gentiles don't even want to consider that. We do exactly what the Jews did. We colonize the kingdom so that we can feel secure. There's too many warnings, you see. There's too many warnings. <laughs> somehow, he's able to keep us. And somehow, you're able to fall away. I don't want to go too far down that road. I'll just leave that there. Here's another one. Where the Greek mind battles. It thinks, okay. So, you say, I'm his enemy, but I'm also loved. How does he do that? Remember, tree of knowledge. I want to understand that. How can he love me and I can be his enemy? And then he says this. The Greek, oh, Greek logic. Oh, he loves the sinner and hates the sin. So it's not me that he hates. He just hates the, the stuff that I do, but he still loves me because nothing can separate me from the love of God. We forget that scripture that says, and so we've got this teaching that goes around. God loves the sin. Sorry, loves the sinner and hates the sin. How many of you heard that teaching? How many of you taught that teaching? No, you're all too scared. You're like, no, I'm just not going to own up here. So then God says this. Does God love the sinner? Yes and no. It's, he it's Hebrew Greek thinking. God loves the world while it's his enemies. He dies on a cross to seek and save that which is lost. But then can he hate the world as well? And Psalm 5 verse 5 and 6. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Hate you all, not what they do. You hate the ones. You destroy those who tell lies. Blood this in deceitful men. The Lord abhors. Whoa. Now it's telling us that God hates the sinner. I'll give you another one. Psalm 11 verse 5. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. Whoops. The Greek's unhinging now. Hang on, so does he hate me or does he love me? Both. <laughs> you can't do both. Because you see, what we do is we bring God down to our level and we can't do both, can we? I either love you or I hate you. I, I can't do both. And so we make a God in our own image. And we pick the side we like that makes us feel secure. And we build a theology around it. And we go, oh, I've got such peace now. But we're eating of the tree of knowledge. Instead of standing in awe like the Hebrews did and saying, God, I don't understand. But I come to you to have life. Because you have life. And I'm going to eat of you when I don't understand. You are my security, not my understanding. It's faith, you see. It's faith. And then when you're saying, oh, but Andrew, you quote an Old Testament. See, Greek does this. Greek thinking, sharp Greek thinkers do this. Andrew, you're stuck in the wrong covenant. When you said the Lord hates, that's old covenant. Those Psalms, that's the old covenant. We've got a better promise in the new covenant. So Greek thinking is trying to wait. And that's what happens. That's the challenge of being a pastor. Whenever you preach something that people don't like, they try and find a way around you. Greeks learn to do that. We've been trained to do that. So we like start thinking, about, no, well, what about this scripture? What about that scripture? And then the New Testament says this in Romans 9 verse 13. Jacob I loved. Esau I hated. And can I ask you why did God hate Esau? Did he commit murder? No. Did he rape and kill and beat women? No. Do you know what he did? He despised his inheritance. Oh my goodness. Is it possible that if you despise your inheritance, 
God might hate you. That if you don't actually seek the kingdom of God first, which you commanded to do in Matthew 6, 33, that God might love you because of his son Christ and hate you. <laughs> can I answer that properly? I think he can, but I don't know how. All I know is I want to be on this side when the chips fall. How do I make sure I'm on this side? Would you said, remain in me and I'll remain in you. <laughs> Seek me first. I'm going to obey you, Lord. I don't understand you fully. I don't, I don't understand how this all works out. I mean, I can try and work some, and I've done that. But God, I'm realizing the more I walk with you, the more I don't know. There's too many scriptures that I ignore. It's like we leave the scriptures out that we don't like so that we can hold on to scriptures that we do like that give us an assurance because deep down inside we have a deep craving for knowledge because when we have knowledge, we have security. And Jesus didn't say, I called you to have knowledge to have security. He says, come to me. Eat of me and you'll live. God, let me satisfy this. God does love you. You need to know that. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. God does not want you to be destroyed. But come to him with the right attitude. Because if you don't, there's a real possibility that he might look at you and say, you arrogant, wretched, pitiful, poor and blind. Come to me so that you can live. Eat of me. Okay. You still with me? See, the challenge with us is um, God, and I need to say this, God breaks the rules he gives us. You think, now, come on, Andrew. You're going too far now. God can't break rules. He's God. He's right. And again, what I'm saying to us is we define, we, we misinterpret, we try and analyze what the rules are. The Greek's thinking, how do the rules work? And then it applies that template onto God and says, this is, is God good? You know how you get to your conclusion? Two ways. I don't understand, but I believe, or, oh, I can work out why he's good. So most of our theology, have you read books like this? Basically, how to make sense of suffering. What's that doing? It's stroking your Greek ego, and it's giving you an understanding. <laughs> I'll give you an example of him breaking his rules. Does God like it if we murder people? Does God say you can kill somebody? No. He says, do not murder. And what does God say about a father and a child or a child and a father? That we to honor this relationship. A father must love his child. If I can't bring my child up in the ways of God, I'm actually even disqualified to be a leader. And so in some ways, I have to love this little girl where she love this little girl and be good to her in all that I do. And never hurt her. And then God comes to the father of our faith, Abraham. And he says to him, you know your son? <laughs> Take him up the mountain and kill him. And Abraham's walking up the mountain going, how can I kill my son? How can, I mean, could God even ask me to do that? Could a good God ask me to kill my son? God hates murder, but now he's asking me to murder. The Bible says Abraham really didn't understand, but he believed. And God said, because you ate of the tree of life. I'm going to make you the father of an entire nation because I want a people that won't understand me, but that'll trust me when I don't make sense. They'll eat of the tree of life and live. They'll come to me like it was in the garden and walk with me and they won't make sense of life and they won't know how it all works and they'll be all right with that because they're holding my hand. And Jesus said, if you don't come to me like a little child, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The problem is we want to come to him like an adult and say, well, God, could we have a debate about what's right and wrong and could I maybe judge you on some of these things? And God's saying, no, you can't. I said I'm right. I said I'm good. And you've got to believe that. Because if you try and work it out, you're going to get in a mess. You're eating of the wrong tree. Does this make sense? I don't think silence is a good or bad thing. The other thing is, really, is we, Greek thinking, it brings system into place. Because remember, logic is systematic. How do things work? Even systematic theology, what's that? It's trying to work out how it works. How do I hold the tensions here? Because there's some big tensions. And the problem is we forget that God is not a system. God is a person. He's a person. <laughs> I 
I mean, I'll give you another example of him breaking his own rules. Romans 12 verse 19. Don't take revenge. In other words, forgive someone that hurts you. Aren't we told to do that? Love holds no record of wrongs. Isn't that something God asks us to do? And he is love. So if God holds no record of wrongs, why will he judge the world if he holds no record of wrongs? Greek thinking again. And then you get universalists. Everyone's saved. And then he says in Romans 12, don't take revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. (laughs) For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And you think, hang on, God. So I've got to forgive and you're going to take vengeance. He says, yes. Okay, God, somehow I know that you can take vengeance on that last day and be righteous and just because on that last day I will see as you see and I'll know that you were always right in what you did. But where I am now, I can't make sense of that, Lord. But I trust you. I'll give you one that freaks out our Greek thinking because we do think individualistic and I, I was chatting with the pastors yesterday and just elders and just sharing with them how Sometimes one person's sin in a church can cause other people in that church to even die. And the Greeks go, what? No, I'm responsible for me. Uh, you know, God will hold me. He's not going to punish me for what my brother did. It's a bit like mom and dad coming home and my sister made a mess of the kitchen. And I get smacked. It's like, that's not fair. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build up just now. I just want to wreck us first. I'm going to wreck us first. <laughs> in 2 Kings 14 verse 6, Jehoash is king of Judah. His father was murdered by a bunch of servants actually. And, and when he becomes a king, he comes into power and he doesn't put the children of the assassins to death in accordance with what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sins. So that's like a good on you. You took the bad guys out. You didn't punish their children. Now that makes sense to us, eh? And then in Numbers 16, 27, three men rise up against Moses, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And uh, they're not listening to him, and they're basically challenging God's leader. And, and so Moses says, okay, there's a showdown going on. Everyone is on their side, you stand there, but everyone who's wanting to live, basically come here. And, uh, and everyone, the wise guys, moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And then it says, Dathan and Abiram had come out, these two men that stood up against Moses, and they were standing with their wives, children, and their little ones, their children, at the entrance to their tents. Did their children do anything wrong? No. In Numbers 16, 31 and 32. As soon as Moses finished saying this, the ground under them split and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all those associated with Korah together with their possessions. They went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything they owned and the earth closed over them. Can God kill the children for the sins of the parents? And the Greek mind says, no, you can't. That's not right. I judge you, God. And God says, I did. I killed the children. But God, you said that we can't do that. He said, oh, you can't do that. I didn't say I couldn't do it. Does that make sense to you? No, God. I'm struggling to get around that. I mean, the Greek mind, my mind starting to think, well, maybe you knew. You know, the Bible says, now I want to pull another scripture in. The Greek mind does this, you see. Maybe the Bible says sometimes the young are taken away to save them from future destruction. (laughs) Ah, now I can fit. I understand again. Now I've got my peace back. Now I can still serve you, God. I'll still serve you because I understand you. Versus, I don't understand, God. I have no cooking clue why you did that. I have no idea. All I know is this, I believe. I believe that you are good when you say you're good. I realize that I am so tainted that I don't even know what good is. I don't even know what good is. I'm 
I'm so twisted. I'm so corrupted. My moral bearing is so skewed that what I think is right maybe isn't right. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because when I see what you do, I realize I'm not like you. And that's what he said earlier. You are not like me. You're, my ways are higher than yours. But you see, we want to be like God. We want to judge God. We want to understand God. And God says, I'm not going to give you that right. One day, you who believe in me will see me as I am. <laughs> see, I mean, can, can God bring bad things and still be good? I mean, the book's about, you know, bad comes from the devil. And, and this is, again, where Calvinists lean this way, but they forget some of the other ones. Isaiah 45, verse 7. Can I say this, my Calvinist brothers? Man, I, I thank God for you. I thank God for men like John Piper. Oh my goodness, it's so wonderful to see those guys standing for the things they're standing. But can I say this? I think fundamentally, we have to realize that every single one of these systems are cracked. There's too many contra contradicting scriptures. And can I say this? If you are a Calvinist, and you call, the thing that bugs me about Calvinists, the one thing is this. You know them as Calvinists. Seriously, you're known because of a school of theology of thought. Instead of coming to Jesus and having love. I think Calvinism got a lot right. More right than a lot of your charismatics today. But seriously, don't be known as a Calvinist. Be known as a Christian. Be known as a Christian. I kind of lean that way, but Jesus, there's a mystery here. But I know that he's good. And, and, and can I say for the Arminian? I'll say the same thing to you. Don't you sit there thinking, oh, Calvin is so blind. You look at this scripture. Look at that scripture. There are scriptures that speak about an assurance that we can have. Somehow. Somehow. All I know is this. I'm staying on the right side of Jesus. I'm walking with him. I'm eating of him every day. I know I'm saved because the spirit of God is leading me and speaking to me. Can God bring bad things? I form the light, God says, and create darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Can God bring disaster? Could God bring an earthquake? Could God bring a famine? He did. He did. Look at your Bible. Look at the plagues. Look at, look at it. And then don't just think, well, there's mystery in these things that we don't understand. And, and again, the Greek mind goes, well, he brought the plagues to Egypt because they were bad. Does God only bring bad things to bad people? Huh? He causes bad things to come to good people too sometimes. Ultimately, it works out for the good, but not the way we think. <laughs> you see, the Greek, I'm, I'm, dear God, have mercy on us. And start reading books of the seven steps how to. You just got to know. Just to burn that thing. It's from the wrong tree. It's the wrong tree. I mean, here's another one. I, I often meet with Christians and they ask this question. Andrew, why don't we see more miracles and healing today? Now, you see, the Greek wants to understand. If we can find the answer, if we can find that key, then we'll get the power. And then we debate. Oh, maybe... We're not ready for it. Maybe, and we've got all these things. Now we've got to find some Greeks are search, searching for knowledge. Can I just throw something out to you? When were the greatest miracles ever done in the history of the world? New Testament or Old Testament? Old. Yeah. Jesus might have walked in the water, but Moses led a nation through the ocean. Think about it. In the Old Testament, the sun went back. When did Jesus do that? People raised from the dead. In fact, the bones of Elisha, the bones of Elisha, a man was thrown into that same grave and he touched the bones of Elisha and he was raised from the dead. The plagues of Egypt. The Old Testament has actually got far greater miracles than the New Testament. And then like God does all these things. But then let me just remind you of this. For 400 years, God starts this nation. He puts them into slavery for 400 years in Egypt. No miracles, nothing. They're slaves for 400 years. Now, that's going to suck if you're one of those 400-year people. 400 years. What did we do wrong? Nothing. I'm just forming you into a nation, and I've got to put you in a protected place. I know slavery sucks, but I'm going to, I've got a plan long term. 
that's going to save mankind. So you're a slave, 400 years, your children's 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 children, you're thinking, where is God? And then suddenly, suddenly, it's not like they repented, it's not like Israel went, oh God, we've sinned. Suddenly, a man right comes back, sent by God, and the miracles start. Plagues. Power. <laughs> he goes through the desert. Food is falling from heaven. It's like McDonald's on the road. <laughs> miracle after miracle after miracle. Why did God suddenly do miracles when he didn't before that? And then the miracles happen, and then you come to the last 400 years before Jesus. And it's interesting, 400 years slavery, 400 years before Jesus, 400 years. The guys are, the guys are trying for the first time in Israel's history. The people have got rid of Asherah and Baal. They're training their children in the ways of God for 400 years. Nothing. And then suddenly, bam, Jesus comes. Miracle, 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 miracle. That's miracle, miracle. Handkerchiefs are being passed around. Him. Shadows, people are getting healed. And then by the end of the book of Acts, I left Epaphroditus sick and this place. Yeah. Paul, I've got the thorn in my flesh. <laughs> Timothy, have some wine for your stomach and your many ailments. Hey, Paul, where's your faith, bro? I mean, you should just Send him a hanky. He'll have his tummy stalted. Why are you talking about wine now? It's like medicine. Why? I don't know. All I know is God does love to do miracles and God does do miracles. <laughs> and then sometimes he doesn't. And it's cool when he does. And if he doesn't, I stand and I believe and I worship. All right. There's a few scary things in Greek thinking, and I, I maybe I need to wrap this. You know, in Greek thinking, we are trained that democracy is a great virtue. The people know best. And we see that when we watch rugby, don't we? I mean, the guy sitting here says, my friend, he was in the, you know, he played rugby when he was 12 in the E team or the third, fourth team, whatever it is, you know. And he's watching the Springboks play, and he's like, I can't believe the coach did that. I know better if I was coaching the Springboks. It's actually what he's saying. If I was doing this, these folks would be whipping the All Blacks. But actually, and, and it's, it's the arrogance of Western thinking. We think we know something, and we all do that. <laughs> the ref was wrong. We would have won if it wasn't for that ref. We would have been the best. Uh, so we've got this concept, and, and for me, and it was interesting, you know, hierarchy for me was a terrible thing. I, I, I was, I'll tell you my story, and then I'll, I'll move this to landing. When I was a young man growing up, I grew up a surfer. And in the days when surfing was still, I mean, if you surfed when I grew up, you didn't tell your girlfriend's parents about it because you would never see you again. It was, surfing was like a subculture. It was like we were these rebels. We, we, you know, you were basically, if you surfed when I grew up, you were a drug addict, definitely. And we were. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> and then, and so there was kind of cool, it was kind of cool, like up in the people, it was kind of cool to not fit in. Don't be like everyone else, be an individual. We wouldn't shop where you shopped. We wouldn't. We had our own little surfing brands that weren't famous in those days. In fact, if it went famous, we'd stop buying those clothes. Because we don't want to be like you guys. We better. That's what we thought. We did. The Burki with his short pants thought the same thing from his Springback rugby team. He looked at us and thought, I'm better than you. Each subculture looked down on the other one. So we used to fight in Jeffrey's Bay. <laughs> Potato farmers and surfers. Fire. <laughs> and then surfing went mainstream. But I kind of grew up and it's mainstream now. Basically, surfing is everyone doing surfing clothes. But the thing is this. I grew up with this anti-establishment. And, and the concept of hierarchy for me was terrible. And actually, Greek thinking thinks that we, I have, what? <laughs> when I got saved, my Jesus, you know, leaders in the church weren't going to be these man of God. That kind of, I was, in the man of God syndrome, I was, I don't want to be that. I want a kingdom of priests. No leaders among us. We just have Jesus. We're all equal. Greek thinking. 
Greek thinking. And if anyone sets themselves up, who does he think he is? Greek thinking. <laughs> and then I go to Zambia. And uh, this is one of the areas that I look back and I go, God, please have mercy on me for what I did there. I went to Zambia, and our first time in one of our guys' churches, Sephas and Bewe, he's not here with us now, but he leads a church in Zambia, and it's a big church, maybe seven, eight hundred people, and I, I arrive at the church, and I'm filling with the story, and then we're going to land. <laughs> I arrive at this church, and there's a car that picks me up, and as I get out the car, there literally are people to take my bag, and I'm like, no, just, I'm, I'm just like you, I'm humble, and Jesus is humble, I'm humble, I'll carry my own bag, no, 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 and they, I'm like, just leave my bag, it's, 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 I'm going to carry my own bag. And I, and I go in, and, I, and then they, they're running up and giving me water, and I'm like, oh, thanks. And, and then I sit, and then I get into the church, and these, it's an African building. It's stinking hot, and there are these guys sitting in these little plastic chairs, and on the front are these leather couches on the stage. And I'm like, I'm not sitting on those chairs. I'm going to go sit on those chairs. No, 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 they say. You must sit on the front. You're the man of God. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Eventually, I realize I'm going to offend guys. So eventually, they drag me in front. I'm sitting. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm just like, yeah, I'm uncomfortable. This is so not Jesus, as far as I'm concerned. Just, this is horrible. And then they got people literally waving fans over us like this. Like I'm Pharaoh or something. And I'm like, this is detestable. This is, for me, this is grieving. This is grieving God. And then somebody comes to bring me water while I'm sitting, and they won't lift their head higher than mine. So they get on their knees, and they come up to me like this with the water. And then they walk back like this. And I'm just thinking, get off your knees. I'm only a man. You see, for me, the Jesus I know would never let you do that. I got up in front of that church, first time I was there, and I rebuked them from every ceiling plank that I could find. I smacked them with everything I could. This is not Jesus. And I sat down at the end, and I was like, yeah, Lord, I did well. Thank you for the wisdom that you've shown me. <laughs> I did. I really thought I did well, you know. And then... Years later, years later, I'm reading in my Bible, and I began to realize that actually maybe I'm a little bit tainted. Maybe my culture is not Jesus' culture. It may be in Greek thinking we're all equal, but maybe in God's thinking we're not. It may be when God appoints a leader, you don't touch the leader, because if God appointed him, you touch God if you touch the leader. And I'd seen so many charismatic leaders fall, I was like, that thing of don't touch God's anointed. I'm also anointed of God. And I sounded exactly like Korah when he rose up against Moses. I found all my reasons why you're not better than me. And I didn't understand that your worth wasn't tied to your position. <laughs> that I was tainted. And I'm not saying this because I want you all to bow down to me. But I realize we've got a problem. Because we have no respect for leaders. Let's go look at Facebook. I put up a post. And every Tom, Dick, and Larry is giving their five cents into it, and even trying to correct me. And I'm just thinking, hear me on this. If I am who I am in God, in the New Testament, hear me on this, in the New Testament, and I'm not just, I'm not saying this for me. Before God, I'm saying this for me. In the New Testament, we warned in James, but these Korah's rebellion, bold and arrogant, these men rise up against those that God has put in authority. You see, in Hebrew thinking, your position that God puts you in is how people will respect you. Not that you earn that respect. And we see that even when Paul writes to the, Jew, to the Christians who are being persecuted, and he writes about Rome that's been put in power over them, and he says, respect the authorities. Respect them. They've been put there by God, and anyone who goes against them goes against God. God, these people are killing us. We're good people. It's not right. It's injustice. We fight against injustice. If good men don't do something, then what? Nothing good will ever happen. And the point is, nothing good is supposed to happen. This world's supposed to go to wreck and ruin. The only way you're going to save it is by the preaching of the gospel, bringing the tree of life and saying, life, come to Jesus and live. If you try and work it out by yourself, you can't. It's corrupted. And Jesus says to the church, come out of Babylon. Christians are trying to infiltrate Babylon. We're going to get in there. We're going to take the seven mountains. And Revelation says, get out of her, because if you stay in her, you're going to be corrupted by her. And you look at some political leaders that are standing up as Christians, and you think of how the compromise is happening, because they're in Babylon, and Babylon is in them. We had the season where God says, get out of Babylon. You don't belong here. 
You're of a different kingdom. You can't go play at the tree of knowledge. Don't try and we're going to take the seven hills. Seriously? Does God need you? Seriously? God is God. Your theology is twisting. Revelation 3 verse 9, coming back to my point. God says this, Hebrew Greek thinking. I'll make those, these Christians are getting flack from guys that call themselves Christians, but he says they actually are synagogue of Satan. And then he says in the second part, I will make them come down, come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I, Dan, come stand on the stage with me. Come stand here. This is what Jesus said he's going to do. One person to another. Now I'll get on your feet. He says, he says this, I'll cause those, these people, to bow down at your feet and acknowledge that you're a man of God. Respect, Hebrew respect. <laughs> Greeks shudder with that. I said to the guys, imagine at the next 412 conference, and don't do this, but imagine at the next 412 conferences, as I arrived, everyone fell on their faces. How many of you had stick around? I asked some of our leaders, I said, we're all out of here. I said, I know. Let's look at this. And listen, I'm, if I want respect, see the thing is this, thank you. You see, we judge the heart as Greeks. But you shouldn't want it. Yeah, you're right, I shouldn't want it. If I want it, God's got a problem with me. If I want the seat of honor, God's got a problem with me. But if God gives me the seat of honor and you don't honor it, then he's got a problem with you. <laughs> and you say, but what happens? You must earn the right for me to give this. And God says, no, I, I didn't. You create tree of knowledge. Honor what I put in positions. Obey and respect your leaders. I put them there. <laughs> don't try and reason. God will judge them stricter. That's your assurance. But don't be a Greek and bring that into the kingdom and think, well, who does Andrew think he is? And I'm not saying this because I need Andrew to be. I'm saying this because this is the kingdom. Am, am I making sense here? It's kind of weird. It's like a pastor talking about tithing. It's, like, it's weird because I benefit and I get that. But I'm actually not saying it's for my benefit. I'm saying it's for your benefit and for our benefit. And actually, I'm saying this for the king's benefit. I'm finished. Let me finish. <laughs> so in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 to 5, I'll leave some out, but we'll do this. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 to 5. The Bible says we're at war. We're at war with the world. We're at war with the prince of this world. We're at war with the flesh. And the, the, the flesh is ultimately that desire in man to want to be like God. And we have weapons that are not the weapons in the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, strongholds are areas of rule and reign that are over cultures and over our minds. We demolish, and this is how they live. Strongholds are formed through arguments and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. So a stronghold over a culture is rooted there because of arguments and high places in that culture that are not God's ways. And we have a duty, it's to take those things down. We have a duty to not colonize the kingdom, but that the kingdom colonizes us. It colonizes our culture. Our culture bows to Jesus, for every knee will bow. We just get it right now. But I think for too long the Greeks and the Greek thinkers have tried to colonize the kingdom. Jesus, you must bow. I need to understand you, I won't worship you. And God says, you will not understand me. You must trust me like Abraham. And I was thinking of Abraham, and I'm finishing now, but Abraham gets this promise of a son, the goodness of God, and then God says, kill the son. And he's walking up the mountain going, and I remember God first had to correct him, because first thing he does, he, he, he acts like a Greek, because there's something of a Greek in all of us, even the Hebrews. I'm getting old. Sarah's getting ancient. Every year it's getting harder to get that promise. Let's make a plan. And they make a plan, and it's the wrong plan. And God says, no, 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 no. Not, you're not going to get the promise through the tree of knowledge. Don't try to work this out. Just keep trusting. <laughs> and Abraham finally gets it, and he repents, as it were, and he, he trusts God. The Bible says he believed God, though his body was as good as dead. The Greek knowledge, the tree is sitting there, and he's like, I'm not eating your fruit. I'm not going to snack on you. I'm going to go to the tree of life, because in the tree of life is life. 
I'm going to believe when I don't understand. And then God gives him the promise. And it's like, yay, he won. He got it. And then God comes again and he says, you know that thing that I gave you, that promise, that boy? The promise boy? Yes, Lord. I want you to kill him. Take him up the mountain and kill him. And Abraham is again faced with the tree of knowledge. How can I kill him? How could God ask me to do this? How will the promise ever work out if I kill him? Or the tree of life. I don't understand. But you are God. And you are good. And somehow you're faithful to your promises. I don't know how it's going to work. And Abraham believes and he eats of the tree of life. (laughs) And he becomes the father of all who believe. God did not ask you to understand. God asked you to believe. And for us as a movement of churches going forward, God is looking for faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And there's two trees in our garden right now. And I think many of us have been snacking on the tree of knowledge. How does this work so that I can make it work for me? Tithe. Give and it will be given to you. (laughs) So if I tithe, is God going to... God says give. It's likely that he's going to bless you because he blesses obedience. But he's a person. It's not a system. You give your tenth. That doesn't mean tomorrow you get your hundred. It might mean tomorrow you lose your job. And will you still believe? Will you still eat of the tree of life? Or will your flesh rise up and you'll run to the tree of knowledge and say, well, I cannot serve a God like that because I don't understand him and it doesn't work the way he promises. Really? He might promise you something, but it might not work out the way you think it'll work out. And I'm going to ask us as a people going forward that we hold, we've got to change our lenses here. And we've got to realize that actually there are contradictions in scripture that God is comfortable with and we need to be comfortable with. Hold your opinion lightly, but hold on to God tightly. (laughs) Because at the end of the day, he knows. At the end of the day, he is faithful. At the end of the day, he's able to finish the work that he starts in you. Walk with God. That's the promise of of, of Adam. Walk with God in the garden like a child. And a child doesn't understand. It just trusts. God's looking for people who will trust him. Though you slay me, God, yet will I praise you. And I want to feel like in closing the session, I want to ask you, have you been snacking at the wrong tree? Is your foundation... Greek, is your foundation the tree of knowledge or is your foundation blind faith? Have you been judging God and working God out? Or do you realize God is bigger than you today? Infinitely higher than you. I wonder if we can pray. Let's close our eyes. Why don't we stand together and close our eyes? Praise you, Father. Praise the Lord. Just as we close the session, you guys can get ready in worship. Two trees in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And God's calling us to the tree of life. He's calling us to believe. He's calling us to hold on to a relationship to a person, the person of God. Not some theological system Because God doesn't fit in our theological systems. He's bigger than them. (laughs) But to walk with God and to acknowledge that we are only flesh, frail, weak, corrupted human beings. But to also then realize by faith that though we have no worth, that God loves us. That God sees us in our arrogance and our cultures and all these things. And he actually wants to save us. But I feel like as much as the Jews came and they drove God out, they ultimately killed him. They couldn't bear what he was saying to them because it it wrecked their world. It wrecked their security. It wrecked what they thought. I feel like for us, there's a real, real, real thing that we do the same thing. And I feel like the Lord is calling us to repent. And he's saying, come, come, leave that tree. And through my son, through faith in Jesus, come back to life. 
Come back to faith. Come back to being like a child. Don't think you know something. Because if you think you know something, you know nothing. But you know the one through faith who knows all things. And if you hold my hand and if you walk with me, I will give you life. And I will teach you how to fit in this world. And instead of trying to understand so that you can control, I will control your world. But I'm calling you to walk with me in relationship. I'm reaching out to you and offering you the tree of life. And I feel like there's got to come a place in us where we come before this God and we say, oh God, forgive us for what we've done. For we have been like the Jews of old. We've done to you just what they did with our little theological systems and our little arrogant pride. Have mercy on us, oh God, according to your unfailing love. We come to you so that we can live. We realize we can't save ourselves even with the things of the kingdom we can't save ourselves. Ultimately, you're the one who saves. And we lean into you, God. We say, we trust you, God. We trust you, God. Though we don't understand, though you slay us, we believe. And today we choose just to take the lenses off and to acknowledge that there's things we don't know, we don't understand, even in your word. But the parts we do are enough to keep us in you. So walk with us, Lord, as we walk with you. Have mercy on us. And lead us. Lead us step by step out of relationship into the fullness of your life. Because like Abraham, our father, we don't understand. But we know you. We know you, God. And we trust you. We trust you as our heavenly father. And I feel like it's in this moment, if you realize that actually... Your assurance has been in the wrong things. Your assurance has been in some system of theology. <laughs> and not in just holding on to God. But maybe you're trying to work things out and trying to understand and grapple with life and in a sense judging God. You know, God can do this, God couldn't do that. <sighs> Playing God, which is idolatry. I feel like there's a moment where we need to just come before Him and acknowledge our weakness and acknowledge our brokenness, and acknowledge our inability to see. And ask Him to give us cell for our eyes so that we can see as He sees. We see Him. <laughs> Come to me, <laughs> He says, so that I can put salve on your eyes so that you can see me, the person of God, the one who loves you, who walks with you as I walked with Adam. If that's you, just right now, why don't we just do business with God? Just however you want to do that. Just yield, surrender. That your assurance, your security is Him. Him. That He is able. That He is God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What are you guys feeling? Right, I want to, you know, if you just realize that you've, you've had this wrong and there's repentance, you're saying, God, forgive me for colonizing your kingdom. I want your kingdom to colonize me. I want to ask you to just lift your hands to the Lord. Just yield to the Lord. Just yield to him. Lord, we yield to you, God. Have your way. We're not going to judge you, Lord, because we don't know how to. We're just going to trust you, God. We're just going to believe you. We're going to walk with you when it doesn't make sense. We're going to walk with you when life doesn't seem to work out like we thought it would. We're going to walk with you because we know that you are God. You're so much higher than us, so much higher than our earthly little ways. You're so much higher than the kingdoms of this world. You can bring them down in a moment, Lord. And we want to acknowledge, Lord God, that our, what you're asking us to do is to simply walk with you, God to believe in you, to trust you. So we yield right now, God, in Jesus' name. We ask for your mercy, your kindness. We appeal to your kindness. Have mercy on us, O oh God, according to your unfailing love. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Forgive us and help us to take strongholds down that set themselves up against you 
who you really are. Forgive us, Lord, and teach us how to go back into our cultures, the worlds we come from, and to take our cultures captive to Christ. That we would be those that colonize this world with the King and the kingdom, the ways of our God, the, the person of our God. That you would come through us and exalt your name, God. In Jesus' name. We end in worship. I'd love us to just come to the King and, and just in worship, acknowledge actually our weakness. Acknowledge our frailness. Acknowledge our unworthiness. But then also to acknowledge Him. The one who's here who walks among us. Stands in this place. And let's honor the King. Let's honor our God. Let's honor Him. I have a sense that for many of us, we um, have found this incredible place of just bending before the Lord while Andrew was speaking. But then for others, I feel the Spirit of the Lord is still trying to get past our reasoning to the, to the deepest places in our hearts. And um, if we forget all the things that Andrew said today, but if we can remember one thing, that God is God and we're not. And I, I feel the Lord wants to touch on that core of what fallen humanity is, is that we think we know better. We think um, that, that, yeah, there's something about us um, that really do not realize how wretched and blind we are. And I, I feel the Lord wants to get past all our reasoning and cut us there. And it's so beautiful what God says is that if we, we humble ourselves before Him, if we, we bend our knee, then He lifts us up. And I feel the Lord wants to lift up a future um, in front of us of where we're going to do great exploits with and for our God. And I, I feel that, but our starting point is, is slow <laughs> so the Lord can lift us up and you know, so even in worship I just feel the Lord wants to get past all that past all that to the core of who we are and who He is <laughs> I just felt to you sing um, some lyrics over us with the same melody You are God and I am not You're the potter, I'm the pot I will follow what you say You're the writer, I'm the page You're the star and I'm the stage Make a masterpiece in us And you're the fire, I'm the word You're the standard of what's good You decide how we should live And even when I disagree Purify this flesh in me Let my soul breathe as I follow thee So we've got lots of um, just maybe just keep your eyes closed because there's an amazing moment actually if we're aware of it there's a, mo a significant moment that, that the Lord has given us to actually make a huge decision this is not just a message that we can lightly brush off and move on with the rest of our day. This is a moment where we actually need to make a call and make a decision. This is not something we move lightly on from and just go into the next session and the next few things that we need to do. And I read this morning um, in, Phil in Philippians, Paul is addressing a bunch of people that have actually taken on concepts and cultures of the world and he's saying to them, don't forget that you're actually now citizens of heaven. And what he's actually saying to them is forget the fact that you have now and then can take on what's around you, but you're now made new creations. You're no longer of the world, you're aliens. And it's a decision and a moment to decide. And we had an amazing moment just now in worship where we're declaring Jesus. And I actually, I actually feel like for us that are in that, that place, we know we need to make a decision right now. Am I gonna am I gonna hold my my own culture above my culture as that of one being from heaven? 
a new culture, a different culture. So maybe you, just as we go into another time of worship, I want to actually ask Nadine. Nadine had a word. If she can come up, I do believe it's, it's relevant for us. And, and out of that, I'd love for us to respond in a way that we make a decision this morning and not just move on. That we declare that this is who we are and move on from that place. Yeah, I just felt on the back of what Andrew shared, for some people, it's actually a life and death situation today. That for some people, just things that have happened in their lives, and actually you just cannot come to that place of bowing the knee before Jesus in faith and saying, Jesus, have my all. I surrender my understanding, God. I, I surrender my life. And that that thing is actually not just keeping you from your inheritance and intimacy with Jesus, but it's keeping you from everlasting life. It's actually literally keeping you, um, it's keeping you out of heaven. It's keeping you from, from the everlasting life that Jesus has for you. And so for some people, I feel such a call from Jesus' heart today to say, come to me. I'm the light, I'm love, but I'm life. I'm alive. It is only me that life is found. But it comes to that place of acknowledging I am God and you are not. That I am the one and only God. And so if that is you today and you've never come to that place where you've bowed the knee before Jesus, then today Jesus is saying, acknowledge actually that that independence from God, that I will have my own way, I want my own understanding, I will find my own way, I will, I will rely on my own knowledge to make my own way through, that, through this life. That's actually sin. Call it for what it is, it's sin. And it says that sin separates us from God. That's what the Word of God says. We can never enter relationship with Jesus into what He has for us now and forever. Because of the sin issue between us and Him. But because there's a sin issue, and Jesus knew that on our own we could never get rid of that sin, He made a way. He made a way, again, not because we are good, not because we in ourselves have any inherent goodness, but because He is good. He is good. He sent His Son, Jesus, the sinless one, the perfect one. He came to make a way for us so that we can have eternal life so that we can have relationship with the Father. And Jesus came and He showed us on this earth what life looked like, what it looked like to have life inside of us. And not just that, He died on a cross. He died on a cross. He carried the penalty for sin so that we don't have to, so that we can come and have a relationship with the Father. But not only did He die, after three days, he rose again. And where is he now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, even now preparing a place for us so that we can have life forevermore. So that we don't need to wonder where we're going if tonight we don't go back to this conference or in 10 years' time or whenever. We don't know when we're going to face judgment day. And Jesus is saying, come to me. Come to me, for I have eternal life. But that requires a giving up. A giving up of your own understanding. A giving up of your own ways. A giving up of your own will. Come to me, for I have eternal life. And if that's you today, and you realize, God, I've been relying on my own good works or my own understanding, or that thing has actually kept me from coming to you because I didn't understand maybe the tragedy that happened in my life, or why my life is not working out the way I thought, then God, today, I surrender. God, today, I place my hope and my faith and trust in you alone, for you are God and I'm not. And God, I want a taste of that tree of life that comes through surrender. And even if it's one person in this place today, it says that all of heaven rejoices when one person turns to Jesus. So I want to ask, is there anyone in this place today who realizes this is my moment? 
this is my moment. Maybe you've done it in measures before, but today it's a Lord. Either you're Lord of all or you're not at all. And God, I want to give you my all today. I want to make you Lord of my life, King of my heart. Is there anyone in this place today? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for those hands going up. Yes, let's rejoice because heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is rejoicing when one sinner turns to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else on the gallery maybe? <laughs> you know, Jesus leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And I so I don't want to miss this opportunity. Is there anyone else in this place today? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So maybe we can just pray together. Maybe you can just repeat after me. Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my all. Thank you that you died for me. That my sins are washed away. As far as the east is from the west. That you fill me with your Holy Spirit. That you make me new. That you enable me to live as a citizen of the kingdom. As a child of God. I am yours. Have my life, Jesus. I am yours. Fully yours. In Jesus' name. Is there anyone who prayed that for the first time today? Okay. Awesome. Let's just give Jesus a hand. Let's just give Jesus a hand.